How's everything there? Oh, it's uh, it's getting better, I think. Uh, things are starting to open up. Amjad, are you there? Oh, I'm just on the phone. So that's, uh, we are nearly there. We are up to about um, two minutes to go. I and I see Asad there as well with Amjad. So they both are sitting in Coventry in UK. Oh, very nice. Yes. <laughs> okay. I think we are, we are about to start. And Hi, Asad, how are you? Good to see you there. Not too bad, Hassan. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. Hassan, you want to introduce and uh, let's start. Sure, um, yeah. Okay. So, so uh, you know, this is really, really an honor for me to, to um, introduce Dr. Walter Jean. Um, just a little bit about his biography. Uh, you know, he completed his undergraduate degree in, uh, at at uh, a Princeton and medical school at Cornell, and then he went on to go train in neurosurgery at uh, in Minnesota, where where both uh, doctors Hiros and Marcos were at the time. Um, and then he uh, completed his skull based fellowship at the University of Cincinnati. Um, since then, uh, the, the way that I um, you know was introduced to to Dr. Gene was that he was my program director at Georgetown University, where you know I was very lucky to train under him and learned a, a, you know a lot. Um, he subsequently moved to George Washington University uh, nearby, um, where uh, you know his interests continue to be skull-based surgery, um, really in all aspects of pathology, including um, endoscopic surgeries as well. And so, um, it, you know, really, it's an honor for me to introduce him. Um, and and his focus is has been and always has been resident education and trainee education. And so I think I think we'll learn a lot today, uh, just in terms of his his thinking and and, and his strategy, um, and and a lot of this was um, you know written in, in one of his textbooks uh, that was published, um, uh, skull based strategies, which which he, he may mention as well. So so welcome, Dr. Jean, and and again thanks for for having us, Salman. Uh, thank you. Um, wow, uh, how do you follow that? Uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Sherry, for inviting me to. Uh, talk in Pakistan virtually. Uh, and also thank you, uh, Hassan Syed, for making the connection. Uh, otherwise, I would have never had this opportunity. Um, I, I'm not going to waste a lot of your time for the preamble here. Uh, this talk is really geared towards uh, trainees. Uh, if, you're, if you're a master surgeon, experienced surgeon, you can turn it off now and go, go have, a, have a cocktail or something like that, because uh, it really is geared towards trainees and, and how we think about skull surgery. So um, uh, without further ado, let me share my screen and get going. Um, all right, can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Yes. So um, again, thank you. Uh, this is, has been a very successful webinar, I understand, and I, I'm, I'm very honored to be part of this. Um, the, the nickname of my talk is, how do you get there? I mean, this is a statement that we hear all, all with, always uh, from trainees. Uh, they see a tumor and go, well, how, how do I get there? Um, the problem, of course, is that a lot of people have a lot of basic knowledge of all these things, clinoidectomies, eyebrow incision, all these elements of, of skull-based surgery. But uh, young trainees often have a difficult time putting it all together into an actual operation. So my, my goal was to uh, put a framework around that and hopefully allow you a, a thinking scheme, uh, give you a thinking scheme to actually construct an operation from these elements and think about a skull surgery in an organized, systematic way. Uh, you will see that it will have a lot to do with uh, building blocks. And uh, we'll get back to this in a second. The formal name of my talk, Modern Skullbury Surgery and Timeless Strategic Philosophy. This, uh, for the strategic philosophy I'm talking about, uh, by the way, everything is written in uh, the introductory chapter of my book, so no one should be taking any notes. Uh, you can always go back there, and it is uh, available in PDF for free on my website. So don't worry about anything. You, you will read that uh, moving forward. The timeless uh, strategic philosophy I'm using uh, as my uh, frame for this lecture is Sun Tzu's uh, Art of War. 
And in The Art of War, uh, Master Song says, uh, the general who wins makes many calculations ere the battle is fought. Do many calculations lead to victory and few calculations to defeat. Well, Walter, I'm so sorry to just to uh, interrupt. Are you able to speak just a little louder or just a comment uh, on the chat? Oh, to the chat, hang on a second. If you can just speak a little bit louder. Oh, uh, wow, no one has ever, am I, do I need to be closer to the mic? Is that better? I think, I think if you come close to your computer, it's, it's gonna be better voice for us. Okay, is, uh, is that any better? Much better, much better. Okay. So I'm gonna be pretty, pretty close to the mic here. Sorry about that. Um, all right, so the, back to the <clears throat> calculations. The first calculation has to be to set the goal. Um, is this operation, is this scan, uh, is this tumor appropriate for uh, endonasal? Well, the, 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 that question cannot be answered until you know what the patient is all about and what the goal of the operation is. So the goal must be the starting point of every uh, construction of every operation. Uh, the goal of the war defines the strategies of the battles. So again, you need to know what the overarching goal is before you can design the operations. And also the goal will define where we stop, which we, I will get to at the end of the, uh, opera, uh, the lecture. Where we stop is a lot more harder to define than when we start. Uh, there's one more reason why the goal is important to define. And that is this, just as water retains no constant shape, so in warfare, there are no constant conditions. Uh, put in another way is that no plan ever survives encounter with the enemy. So when things go wrong in the operation, the goal defines how you can uh, get back out of it, uh, out of trouble, and uh, always having the goal in mind is important to correct any battlefield problems. So how do we set the goal? There are three factors that allow you to set the goal. First one is very easy to understand, patient factors. These are things that we learn about in medical school, comorbidities, whether someone is on the blood thinners, whether this uh, condition or tumor has been previously treated, et cetera, et cetera. These are very easy to understand why they're important for setting the goal. An example, this tumor, well, what is the goal? Well, it depends on who the patient is. If the patient is a 24 year old student with facial numbness, one, the goal might be a complete resection. On the other hand, if the, if the patient is a 74 year old woman with metastatic breast cancer, the goal is entirely different. And when the goal is different then the operation that you choose will be different. So again, patient factors. Anatomical factors is the, set, are the second set of factors we use to set the goal. The size of the tumor, the location, what does it engulf and tangle? Does it involve areas we shouldn't go? Here is an example of about that. Uh, there are towns which must not be besieged, positions which must not be contested. The power of shrewdly calculating difficulties, dangers constitute the test of a great general. Battlefield map, 1805, Austerlitz. Uh, for those of you who knows French history, this is the battle that won Napoleon a huge prize and a very famous victory. The, in the middle of the map, I hope my uh, pointer is obvious, is a place called Pretzen's Height. Napoleon understands that if he can take Pretzen's Height and if, he, if, the Russian, if the Prussians relinquish Pretzen's Height, the battlefield will be his. So he set a trap. He set a trap down in this low-lying area for the Prussians to come off of. And indeed, the Prussians uh, followed the trap, left Pretzen's Height and attacked this lower air lying area and Napoleon was able to gain his victory. So terrain uh, is important and there are areas that they should have never gone and there are, there are places that we should never go. An example neurosurgically, of course, is the cavernous sinus. If the patient has normal ocular motor movement, uh, cavernous sinus probably is an area that we should not go and that should factor into the goal setting of the operation. Surgeon factors are important. Um, if you know the enemy and know thyself, there will be 100 victories in 100 battles. Uh, is my training and experience enough to do this operation, a total resection? Very famously, uh, Henry Marsh in his book, uh, First Do No Harm, said that uh, he took the last piece of tumor and the basilar started bleeding and killed the patient. So there are uh, maybe for that patient, a complete resection, leaving that last piece should be uh, uh, is a good idea. 
and a complete resection may not be the proper goal. So setting the goal, you need to ask yourself, what, what has happened to you before? Uh, and what is your training about? What is your team like to set the goal for the patient? And the most important comp uh, issue here is your personal experience of complication. As Rene LaRiche once said, every surgeon has a tiny cemetery uh, where he goes to uh, think about his previous failures and inadequacies. And understanding your own experience with complications help you become a better surgeon. Uh, these are personal and very emotional uh, experiences that you should use to strengthen your uh, skills and experience, and those uh, skills and experience do influence on how you set the goal for the patient. So those are three factors, patient and atomic and certain factors that help you set the goal. All right, second calculation, choosing the approach. This is the meat of the lecture here. Water shapes its course according to the nature of the ground over which it travels. Uh, the soldier works out his victories in relationship to the foe whom he is facing. There are Thousands of tumors, each with different size, configuration, location, histopathological identity, and entanglement of critical structures. With thousands of tumors, there must be thousands of operations. How do we ever teach trainees one thousands and thousands of operations? Well, they are no more than five cardinal tastes. Sour, acrid, salty, sweet, bitter. Yet combination of them yield more flavors than can be tasted. So again, we're back to building blocks. These are the building blocks of my little children and they say, just, you know, rip it out. So uh, building blocks uh, give us a language, building blocks give us meaningful sentences and building blocks will give us a meaningful operation to tank to, to uh, fight those thousands and thousands of tumors. And we only need 26 alphabets in the English language, for example. Okay, so what are the building blocks of a skull base operation? They are corridor, craniotomy, and modifiers. I teach all my residents and trainees the CCM system. You go corridor, craniotomy, and modifiers. Let's take a look at an example of what these things are. Um, by the way, when you think of constructing an operation, I would like you to think of the operation in reverse. So don't think of, you know, it's very easy to think of an operation in forward. Uh, how you cut the skin, then how you drill the bone, then how you open the dura. Actually, when you try to construct an operation, you should be the backwards. You should be, how does the tumor get out of the skull? Um, and in, in reverse engineering the design of the operation, it becomes easier, and I'll show you how. The first thing that you think about uh, in this reverse engineering is the corridor. Corridors are natural anatomical planes in the brain and between the brain and the base of the skull. The natural formation of the country is the soldier's best ally. And so corridors are the best allies of the neurosurgeon. Here's an example about court, uh, anatomy and terrain and how I mean, in the battlefield you use it. Uh, you may remember this battle from the movie Patriots with Mel Gibson. Now he was Morgan in, this, in that story. Uh, and you may remember that uh, battle scene in the movie uh, the uh, Continentals, the uh, soon to be uh, US troops, they are not US troops at that point, of course, they were hiding in again, a low lying area behind the main line of militia. And the Brits uh, didn't see them uh, because they were shielded. And in so because of that, they decided on a frontal attack of the militia center. And when they got close, then the Continentals revealed themselves and were, ab were able to uh, defeat the Redcoats in that battle. So knowing the terrain uh, of that uh, area was critical in how you deploy the troops and knowing the anatomy is how critical uh, surgeons can construct the operation. And the first thing to know are the anatomical corridors. Fortunately, we have very sophisticated tools now to let us uh, to allow us to determine which is the best corridor. Here's an example using the anatomical corridors to conquer this pineal tumor. The three traditional ways of getting there are using the uh, infratentorial corridor, the interhemispheric transtentorial corridor, and the posterior la uh, posterior midline corridors. Uh, we have very sophisticated tools nowadays, like virtual reality, for example, showing that this tumor is very difficult to attack uh, from up top uh, because it is shielded by the corpus callosum from the top. 
better to go from underneath the tentorium. Now the midline is extremely steep and the climb may be challenging. So uh, still staying in for tentorial, maybe a paramedian corridor has a slightly lower slope and may be more comfortable for the surgeon to attack in between the vein of Rosenthal and the precentral vein of the uh, cerebellum. So corridors, corridors, corridors. You, we had to find the first, cor uh, first uh, find the corridors to construct the operation. Water runs away from high places and hasten down hills. So in war, the way to avoid what is strong is to attack what is weak. Whenever there is a cyst, that may be the area to attack because it is weak. It will open up a lot of space for you to take out the tumor. And if you have a cystic portion, that might be uh, the right place to uh, go first. So with this particular tumor, you would want to find a corridor, for example, maybe the uh, infratentorial uh, supracerebellar corridor, or maybe a lateral transtentorial uh, subtemporal corridor would be uh, the right corridors to attack this uh, and cyst first. These are the common corridors that everybody knows about, subfrontal, interhemispheric. I am not going to belabor the point. These are natural anatomical planes between dura and skull, uh, between uh, dura and brain, and uh, that needs to be considered first. Every corridor has a door. The door is the craniotomy. So if you have so th that many corridors, do you have that many doors? No, that makes our lives very simple. In fact, doors, the craniotomies are pretty straightforward. They are pretty, uh, a, a set of corridors may have the same door. So that simplifies our construction by quite a bit. Example. The anterior corridor as a subset has a bifrontal craniotomy at its door. The anterolateral corridors, the transylvian, transcavernous, lateral, subfrontal corridors, all has one standard opening as the craniotomy, as the door. So again, this simplifies our uh, construction of the uh, operation by quite a bit. In the sagittal plane, uh, for example, uh, the in the posterior lat uh, posterior inferior corridors all have a, uh, a similar door, so that simplifies our task a little bit. So doors cor uh, craniotomy is number two. Finally, the modifier. What are these modifiers? Well, when the door that is the craniotomy is not wide enough, then you're going to need the modifiers. These are things that allow you to open the door wider. Maybe you need to bust through the wall, bust through the frame of the door to get there. These are the osteoorbitotomies, the zygomatic osteotomies, the anterior petrosectomies, the posterior petrosectomies, the condylectomies that you can add on to these various uh, craniotomies to make the door wider. And these are your modifiers. So let's test the method out. Here's a pretty challenging tumor, 37 year old healthy man with progressive balance problems. The goal, uh, always set the goal first. The goal is with brainstem decompression and possible complete resection. Let's look at, uh, so number one is corridor. I would pose to you that the posterior lateral corridor is a pretty good one to use to get the tumor out. So how does the tumor exit? Posterior lateral corridor. The standard craniotomy for a posterior lateral corridor is the retrocyte. So there you go, that's pretty straightforward. Now, modifiers. You notice that the tumor involves zone two of the clivus and zone three of the clivus. It's a pretty low lying clival, preto clival tumor. You also know that for zone two, uh, the posterior petrosectomy is a good modifier to enlarge your retrosigmoid corridor. And for zone three, the condylectomy is a good modifier to open uh, the wider the. Um, uh, retrosigmoid uh, craniotomy. So fine, you add those in and voila, you have your operation. Your operation is therefore a posterior petrosectomy and transcondylar approach for combined pre and retrosigmoid uh, resection of the petrol clavumin and geoma. So the method works. Uh, and uh, yeah, so there's your scheme. Remember the calculations that Master Sun uh, said we have to make. Third calculation, uh, the planning, the resection. Uh, it gets a little bit harder and more nuanced when we talk about planning the resection. There are three conditions that affect the resection portion of the operation. Controlling the space, managing your time and tempering your zeal. 
The good fighter first puts themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and waits for an opportunity for defeating the enemy. So when you get there, after you've gotten there, the first thing you do is to protect those critical structures. And you notice where the basilar artery is, you notice where the optic nerve is, you know where the facial nerve is, so that you can protect all those things right off the bat. Uh, you can attack the blood supply first. For example, for this tumor, you can attack the ventricular blood supply first, and that will protect your space and make your working uh, safer, faster, and more efficient. And finally, you protect your workspace so that it doesn't collapse on you. So you may not want to take all the margins of the tumor yet. You may want to take the center portion of the tumor and preserve the working space uh, and not let it collapse on you. So controlling the space. Managing your time. There is a natural pace to every operation and the, the operation moves smoothly if you can anticipate what the transitions are. I always tell my trainees also that there is always a moment that a tumor uh, gives you that lets you defeat it. The opportunity to defeating the enemy is always provided by the enemy himself. You have to seize these opportunities or else they will go away. An example is that, for example, you're doing six centimeter acoustic schwannoma, uh, vestibular schwannoma, and there are always those times in the operation where the tumor suddenly shows you the borders, suddenly shows you the capsule. And if you don't take those opportunities and preserve that plane right away with a cottonoid or, or some sort of uh, uh, tool, you will not see that margin or that capsule ever again because blood will seep in there, get coagulated. You won't see the planes as clearly. So if the tumor gives you the way in, you have to take it. You have to recognize the opportunity and take it right away. Here's a battlefield example of that. Uh, this is now American history again, uh, 1863 in the Battle of Gettysburg. At the southern tip of the uh, Union line, uh, the southern tip of the Union line is on a place called Little Round Top and is guarded by the 10th, uh, 20th Maine Regiment. Faced uh, across from them are Alabamans and Georgians who are charging up a hill, and they are definitely winning the battle for a moment. They have all the ammunition they need, and the uh, people from Maine uh, holding the Union line were running out of bullets. They were actually down to the last bullet per person. <clears throat> Famously, uh, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, later to be uh, Bowden's president, said uh, to his troops, well, we're running out of uh, bullets, so let's fix bayonets. And he decided to charge down the hill. That was an opportunity that was given to him by the uh, Southern troops. By charging down the hill and surprising the enemy, he was able to sweep them uh, off of the field and thus preserve the uh, Southern tip of the Union line uh, very, very importantly. Um, and so that, is an uh, example of taking a bad situation, seizing the moment and turning it into your advantage. So the final part of controlling uh, the resection or uh, performing the resection is tempering your zeal. The victorious strate strategist only seeks battle after the victory has been won. Supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. If you find yourself struggling and you're there's a, there's a golf term for this, it's called grinding. If you find yourself grinding in an operation, just things are not moving well, that could mean one of two things. One is that you design the wrong operation and two, you design the wrong goal. Uh, if, you, if the goal is set properly and the operation is designed properly, the operation should go pretty smoothly without real struggles. And if you're in fact struggling, then you may have to set back and say, hey, wait a minute, uh, have I gone beyond the goal or is the goal set improperly? And this goes back to a very important question, which is knowing when to stop. Um, so from the, the nickname of our talk, uh, as I said, was how do I get there? Now we've turned about where do we stop? And for the trainees in the audience, I would have to tell you that this is, you know, to teaching you how to construct an operation takes you know, I don't know, a short period of time, not, not so long. By the time you're, you're a junior trainee, a mid-level trainee, you should know how to design an operation. Where to stop takes decades. 
because um, this is the art of neurosurgery. Um, and of course, it's very philosophical and everybody has different takes on it. And it also colored by your own experience, once again, colored by mainly your complications that you've encountered. Total resection, the, probably the two most dangerous words in skull-based surgery, they are equivalent to the battlefield uh, equivalent is unconditional surrender. Now, you can't possibly imagine that unconditional surrender or total resection are the, is the only goal for every operation. That would, if, if you think so, then you're seriously lacking imagination. Unconditional surrender was the goal for Appomattox, Virginia in 19, uh, 1865. Sorry about the slide. That's the Civil War of the United States. Unconditional surrender certainly applied for World War II. But unconditional surrender for Yorktown 781? That is the battle of independence for the United States. Uh, no, we, there was no uh, possibility that the, the, the Brits were gonna unconditionally surrender to the US. That was not the goal. And that was not the goal of the Saigon 1975. No way. There was no way that the North Vietnam, uh, North Vietnamese would unconditional surrender. It was always a sued peace uh, that was the, the goal of the, uh, the battle or the goal of the war. So unconditional surrender is not the only goal, total resection is not the only goal, and must be very nuanced about where to stop. So the hardest thing to learn is knowing when the goal is accomplished, where the traps are beyond the goal, and for foregoing a pretty scan, or foregoing the defense of your reputation, and stop. At a point of the operation, you say, okay, the goal has been accomplished, um, the, the brainstem has been decompressed, the optic nerve is now free. You know what? I'm done. And for young attendings even, it's very hard to do that because you feel like, oh, my boss is going to yell at me for not taking all the tumor. Or, or the scan is going to be really ugly. There's going to be a big residual. Hey, but maybe that residual is in fact what protects the patient. You have to put the patient first and the surgeon celebration second. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is my final slide and we'll open up for, for a discussion, which I'm sure will be much more interesting than my talk. A clever fighter is one who excels in winning with ease. His victories bring him neither reputation nor credit. He wins battles by making no mistakes. So don't do what uh, Henry Marsh uh, said that he did uh, mistakenly, which is taking that last piece of tumor when it's not necessary, just to make the scan pretty, because that bite may give you the, you could completely ruin the operation, not only for you, but more so for the patient. So always remember what your goals are and always, well, you need to learn to not recognize when the goal has been achieved. And most of the time, if you're starting to grind during the operation, that's when the problems begin. So again, a lot of this is, has been written down. You, don't, you, can, you can find all of this uh, in, in the introductory chapter of this book. And the final thing I would say um, before thanking the organizers is this. Um, we have a webinar that's starting next week that, uh, that uses a case-based format to, to teach all this uh, sort of uh, skull-based surgery and the philosophies and, and whatnot. So I hope that you, all of you will consider joining us. You'll find this on my website and, and other um, social media sources. Um, I know I've, I've probably gone a little fast, um, hopefully not so much, uh, but thank you, uh, Dr. Sharif, and thank you, Hassan, for making the, the connection again. And it's, uh, I hope you learned something, and I really want to take the questions so that we can uh, continue this discussion beyond what I have to uh, ramble on and on about. So I'm going to stop sharing here and look at all of you. Um, okay, questions? Azim, you're unmuted. I just want to say it was an excellent presentation. I think really uh, very well organized in a way that was uh, understandable and digestible. Um, I think your points, particularly about where to stop, are, are really uh, poignant uh, because this is uh, you hit on all the emotional aspects of the surgeries, which is 
especially when, when you're starting out, is that you want to do a good job. And that good job isn't uh, necessarily manifest in the goals of the operation. That's not known to the person that's casually observing scans the following day. They call Monday morning quarterbacking. Uh, they haven't met the patient. They don't know any of the history, but the scans are readily available. And so uh, people often form their judgments without complete information. Uh, however, having, having said that, um, I think another key aspect uh, is there's a difference between uh, someone starting out and someone with experience, all other things being equal, talent being equal, and uh, other factors. And the difference you know, that, that experience provides you uh, is your ability to perhaps remove more of, of the tumor, uh, potentially, understanding where those uh, pitfalls lie. And so this um, key and important aspect of this is, is self-reflection after things went well and also reflection after things go poorly. And that's, that's helped me quite substantially to be able to, to improve. So I'd like to uh, query some of the people that are listening to the presentation um, as to uh, uh, what they took away from, from this uh, presentation today. Let me let me start one thing about uh, to piggyback on what you just said, which is uh, about the complications in learning. You know, uh, there is no two surgeons that could design or do the same operation, mm -hmm. and, and the reason is, I mean, even even if your training is identical, even if your skill level and experience is identical, the way that uh, the the way the, the 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 number and the kinds of complications that each surgeon encounters is entirely different, and because your complication profile is entirely unique, that makes you a unique surgeon. And plus, even, even if there's a theoretical chance that everybody's complications are the same, the way you emotionally react to those complications are different. And so it, some, some people are somehow able to shut out uh, uh, the emotional aspect a little bit better than others, and other but takes them really deeply and really, you know, really, uh, uh, it really hits your soul. And in, in, in so doing, that changes you as a surgeon. You've got to, as you said, reflect on those, learn from those and say that, hey, I've done this several times and, and, and you know, three out of the six times I've done it, it, it had a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. Hey, maybe, maybe that I was taught wrong and maybe that wasn't the right thing. And hey, I, I'm not gonna do this anymore. I'm gonna change what I do, uh, modify uh, what I do. So those experiences are, are paramount in, in your development, in each of everybody's development as surgeons. So, so never just kind of shut those complications away. Really, they have to be forefront in the middle of your consciousness, and they should make you a better surgeon. The, 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 both of my major teachers in life, uh, in, in, in neurosurgery, uh, Roberto Heros and Harry Van Loven, both make this a huge point of their teaching. It's how you utilize your complications to learn. Um, and so again, I wanna highlight that, uh, yeah. I think the other, the other interesting aspect about uh, the complications and self-reflection is that as, as time goes on, it becomes not easier, but harder uh, to stomach. Um, I'm still relatively early in my career having uh, I've been doing this for about eight years now, but the, you feel like, okay, I, I should be better than this at this point, or I should be, I should uh, not have fallen into the same trap, but uh, the, those traps are very enticing oftentimes, you know, it seems uh, relatively straightforward, you know, that last uh, bite of tumor, um, perhaps it'll go well, uh, usually it's okay, maybe you can quote unquote get away with it. Um, I, I'd like to, you know, caution particularly the trainees against hope. Um, uh, you know, there's often this, this sentiment of hope. I hope it goes okay. When, when you have this sentiment of hope, it, it's never going to be okay. You know, you have to have, have a sense of there's beyond a reasonable doubt that this is going to be, this is going to work out okay. The, the other thing uh, I talked to the residents about is that a, a slow walk through the park is much better than a short mugging. Uh, because if the approach is so key 
uh, and one of the things that, that I liked the, the way that you laid out your presentation so beautifully was that you went step by step. You know, the, the door, if the door is not open, the corridor is going to be narrowed. The cor then everything builds on itself. So then when the corridor is narrowed because the door is not open all the way, then that makes the, the, the real thing that you're there to do, which is separate the tumor from the normal anatomy, uh, much, much more difficult. So each step has to be done enough and done well so that, and oftentimes that, that, in, that means more for skull-based surgery, it means more drilling. Um, the, the more drilling that you do, safely that is, uh, the more drilling that you do, the wider you open that corridor potentially uh, uh, in a safe manner, the, the better the resection will be and the safer the resection will be. And, and these, those building blocks, if I can use that same analogy in a, in a slightly different way, the building blocks, they, the base has to be strong. Uh, and as you build higher and higher, uh, uh, you'll be able to uh, get to greater heights. If the base is not strong, you have no chance. Uh, and that's where the complications tend to lie from what I, I've experienced. Questions from the field? Yeah, we switch on. Francisco is there. He wants to ask something. Please uh, uh, take your name and where you're from, and then please ask your question then. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. My name is Francisco. I'm from Mexico City. Thank you for the beautiful presentation. I want to ask something. Um, many times we hear that we can develop all the skills necessary for skull pass surgery, but the really is that not everyone has the same gift. How we develop the to identify the limits in the context of the countries in developed countries without the section laboratories and how to balance the patient protection and the need to improve the surgical skills. Thank you. Wow, uh, <laughs> that question is going to take four hours to, 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 to talk about. Uh, you, you've hit on all the major uh, uh, important points of how to train surgeons, uh, especially in, in a global uh, setting. Uh, there are so many aspects of that question. Let's try to try to take some of it apart. Um, recognizing your personal limits. Uh, my God, uh, th that that takes what decades until the end of your career to really to really figure out. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out what the, what the limits of my abilities are for sure. Um, th that again goes back to the soul searching that you do, uh, if not every day, then certainly every week. Uh, hey, how has this week gone? Uh, what has gone well, what has gone poorly, uh, and, and recognizing uh, the limits. Uh, the cadaver lab is absolutely paramount. Uh, you, you, you cannot develop the skills um, and, and the knowledge of the anatomy, both, uh, just by operating on patients. I certainly hope you don't. Uh, and uh, using the lab, going to labs, if, if you don't have it to go to the lab, where, where places have labs is important. Uh, using technology is important. We, we are heavy, heavy invested in uh, virtual reality and, 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 and uh, augmented reality. And those simulators are, are becoming more and more prevalent. Those help you a lot. Um, as to developing these skills uh, in uh, globally, well, uh, you know, I, I've, as you may know, that I'm also part of a global neurosurgery inst institution with Hassan Syed, uh, the Global Brain Surgery Initiative, and we've gone to places like Vietnam and Panama and other places and so on to, to operate with folks. Uh, what I've universally found is that uh, surgeons are surgeons are surgeons. The skills and the knowledge exist everywhere. Uh, now, how you apply them, the, the, how the hospitals support your surgeries, they are very, very different from one place to another. But uh, th there is no limit as to, as to what you can or cannot do in, in globally. Um, th the only factor is you know, material support, financial support, ICU support, and, 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 and whatnot. When do you refer out? Uh, again, that goes back to the soul searching. Uh, I think that you, you have to, when, you, when you're looking at a challenging tumor, you have to ask yourself, uh, not only do I have the skills to do this, but do, do I have the experience and does my ICU support this? Do I have the, 
Do I have the equipment and the technology to, to do the best job that anybody can do in the world? Um, and, uh, you know, look, look at what we're doing here. We've got 270 some participants. So everything is global now. So if, you, if, if people want to ask questions and get consultations globally, uh, I think we should, that should be more and more and more prevalent uh, as, as we move forward on this. Uh, I hope I answered some of those uh, aspects of that huge question. Excellent question. Um, Asam, what do you think? Uh, no, I, I totally agree with you. I, I did want to uh, just emphasize one point. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize one point in terms of your presentations. Um, you know, as training with you in conference, you always, um, you know, emphasize, you know, what are the goals of surgery? And especially for those trainees that are starting out, seeing consults in the ER um, or in clinic, um, it, you know, it's very easy to look at an image and then jump to how are you going to uh, take this tumor out or what are you going to do in surgery? But I think what also um, uh, is important is to understand, you know, the history and, and what the goals of surgery are. And that really helps, um, you know, you decide what the indications of surgery are as well. So I just wanted to emphasize that point uh, of yours as well. I, I think that uh, there are definitely some barriers uh, in the developing world uh, to gaining uh, this expertise uh, without a dissection lab. It makes that trial trial and error that you can do without any consequence in a dissection lab, it makes it more difficult. What I will still say, however, is that uh, I think it's all, all that much more important that uh, you take from the operation every last morsel that you can get out of it. And what I mean Absolutely by that, agree. Completely agree. Yeah, what I, what I mean by that is that, you know, when, when you're doing, when, even before you, you approach the operation, you know, engage in a lot of thought exercises. What if the tumor were, were bigger? What if the tumor were slightly differently oriented? Would my approach still work or would it not work? And when you think about these things ahead of time, you can be a better observer at the time of the operation, or if you're doing the operation yourself, you'll take note of certain factors, certain barriers to how you would have approached that. And I think it's always best to write these things down. The more you write down ahead of time, it helps you organize your thoughts. You can make presentations if that's the way that you do it. Um, but some method of organizing your thoughts such that uh, you can then reflect afterward. I think another really important thing is that once once the tumor is out, you know, there's a, okay, the tumor is out, let's hurry up and close. Don't take your time, take, take 15 minutes to look around and think about what can you see from this approach with the tumor that, that was there. Now the tumor oftentimes creates the corridor for you. So that's an important thing to consider. A small deep tumor is much harder than, than sometimes a large tumor is because the larger tumors can make the corridor for you in, in certain respects. But uh, so think a little bit about if the, tumor, if the tumor were bigger, how would I approach it? What, are, what, what am I able to see at the end of this resection? Was I able to see everything or, or uh, are things uh, missing? Uh, so I think that's, those are some of the things. And then reflection afterward is critically important. Okay, I think Hamid uh, uh, Shinwari wants to ask a question. Please go on, introduce yourself and where you're from. Uh, thank you, sir. Very good presentation. This is Dr. Hamid Shinwari uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, uh, my question is that, uh, that as a PG, how we can learn when to stop operation? What are the recommendations, sir, from you? Thank you. Can you, can you, uh, can you say the last sentence again? It, it, how, how would you learn? How, uh, how we can learn to stop operation? When oh. we face the problems, uh, yeah, this is the moment, one point. It goes back to the what are your recommendations? It, it goes back to setting the goal properly. The, the question, I, I, if I understood it properly, I think that I think the question was, how do you learn how to stop? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, emphasize that, that that is the hardest thing to, to learn, and it probably takes decades, if not if not long, your whole career, to know when to stop. Uh, it goes back to what Dr. Syed was saying, which is you've got to set the goal properly. You, 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 it, 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 all, it should be determined before you even walk into the operating room. Your goal is to say, if the goal is to decompress the brainstem, 
you walk into the operating room and you put on the board, the blackboard, a whiteboard, whatever color board you have and say, the goal is to decompress the brainstem. And what Harry Van Leveren was sometimes also right is, if the patient dies, uh, the kids are orphans, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> and to remind himself to, to stop once the brainstem has been decompressed. So then that is the goal. You tell everybody in the room that that is the goal. And you, as you go along, you, you, you stop moment, to, you know, at, at times to say, have I, have I done the, have I done the job? Is the goal met? Keep going. Have I done the job? Is the goal met? As soon as you say the goal of the operation has been accomplished, you should seriously think about stopping. Because if you're going forward, you may fall into a trap, you may uh, start grinding, and you may have trouble. So how do you learn? You, the only way to learn is to reassess every operation when, when you get done. Uh, you know, how was the goal met? Was the goal met at the limit? Was the goal met beyond the, the, the limit? Um, and uh, with experience, you will come to a better understanding of that question. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 My name is Ibrahim Subay. I am from Jordan. I am a skull based surgeon. I've been in the skull based surgeon committee of the World Federation for the last 22 years. Um, I uh, really appreciate your presentation. Thank I have you. a few points to comment on, if I may. Uh, first, I think we have to stress the fact that cadaveric lab is essential for training. It is a must, and it must be included in every residency program. Yep. Not to be a skull-based surgeon, but to really learn in neurosurgery, learn how to do trional approach or transcalosal approach before we learn how to do skull-based surgery. It has to be local, because in the current state of the world, traveling, security, coronavirus, you name it, the cost of the travel, the cost of the hotel, the cost of the courts, etc. It all reflects on people not being able to be trained in, in this. So I believe that every country must have a cadaveric lab, even if it is two stations. In Jordan, we have about eight stations of cadaveric lab that we established about six, seven years ago. But even if it is one station, if it's two stations, even with a primitive microscope that even a poor country can get from the World Federation, there is place for poor countries, poor institution to go to microscope and micro drill, et cetera, from the World Federation with a very, very low price. I know this because I'm part of uh, the, the World Federation. Uh, the other point is that we have to make people believe that I don't have to be a skull surgeon to drill the anterior clinoid process or drill the base of the temporal lobe to minimize retraction. And people think that the drilling is the, is the, the job of, an, of a skull based surgeon. It is not. It should be in the domain of any average skull, of any, an average neurosurgeon. And uh, the last point I want to make is that in this part of the world, third world countries, uh, you would not believe it, but this is a fact. Lots of residents graduate from residency programs without logbook of the surgeries they have done. So you will find a neurosurgeon with a certificate to practice, and I call it certificate to kill, without having done any proper neurosurgery. The only surgeries they do during the residency program is to do bird hole for evacuation of subdural hematoma, or to put a shunt, or to do a disc. If they do these three things, they think they are neurosurgeons, and then you give them a certificate, and I say this is certificate to kill. Because once they have the certificates, nothing can stop them. We have to stress this fact in the, this part of the world that training should be aiming at producing a good general neurosurgeon and not a neurosurgeon who can do these three simple procedures. Last point, I stress it. I have nothing against Mr. Uh, Mark Greenberg and his book, the Green Book Handbook. Uh, it is good for revision at the night of surgery, but it is not good to be taken as a textbook to study during your residency program. The problem with this, and I, and I know it firsthand, that lots of residency program in this part of the world, they ask their resident to uh, read from Greenberg, and that's enough. I say it is not enough. I have nothing against Mr. Greenberg, but I have lots against people 
taking this as a textbook. It is a handbook and handbook in English. If one goes into the dictionary, it says something to operate a machine, TV machine or a car or whatever. It is a handbook and it is not a textbook. Once again, I thank you for presentation. And uh, also I have a presentation after you about radical accession of cranial pharyngeomas. I hope you will join us. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I agree with all the comments. A little to add on that. Oh. You're okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I, there's an error message. But I completely agree with all those comments. Uh, I, I think that, uh, yeah, globally, there should be uh, a standard really on, on what uh, constitutes a neurosurgeon. And if you're only able to do those three operations, certainly that makes you very dangerous. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and again, uh, th that's why global neurosurgery is becoming such a hot topic. And uh, that's why people like myself travel to uh, teach around the world, hopefully to uh, really standardize a sort of certification process of all uh, neurosurgeons. Uh, Kristina has a question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I have a question. And before, thank you for the great presentation because I felt uh, the philosophy very well. Uh, I'm a young neurosurgeon. I was uh, completing my training one year ago. So basically, I just worked by myself uh, for one year. And uh, what I learned from the master like you and the other Scalpis giants in the world that experience, experience is one must thing. And uh, but in this high technology era, we have new tools like endoscopy and the other minimal invasive approaches. Uh, I want to start to study endoscopy as soon as possible uh, to have better uh, learning curve, as you know that endoscopy needs learning curve too. But in the other hand, I have I don't have enough uh, experience as a skull based uh, surgeon. So what do you think about that? What is the, the, the best time to jump or study to the other uh, approach like endoscopy or minimal invasive before we have enough experience uh, in skull base? Well, again, that's a, that's a multifaceted question uh, that uh, would take a while to answer. I, I think that uh, endoscopy is here to stay. I think an endoscopy uh, should be uh, utilized liberally. Uh, it should be uh, no different than the microscope. Uh, in the best in the best world, you would have an endo endoscope and a microscope, and you would use those two visualization modalities interchangeably. You say, okay, this is easier to do in a microscope, use a microscope, or this is easier to use an endoscope, use the endoscope, and in fact, switch back and forth whichever modality is, is uh, appropriate uh, for the portion of the operation that they are applicable. What is the best time to learn? Well, there's no better time than now. If you're a first year out, you're in the perfect position. Well, in fact, trainees even better. It, it, you're in a perfect position to learn and learn and learn. The one thing about endoscopy that I would I would say, and, and, and I'm not the world's, I mean, you had Danny Pervadella here last week. So, um, you know, I, I'm not the world's expert in endoscopy, but I use it, as I described, I use it interchangeably with the microscope uh, as, it, as it applies. And, it, the, the thing is, the most important thing is not the skill to start off with. The important thing is actually patience. I'll, I'll say that again. The important thing is actually your patience. You, if you get frustrated with using the endoscope, uh, you are never going to use the endoscope because you're all, we're all much more comfortable with the microscope because that's more prevalent at this particular time of development in neurosurgery. But the endoscope should be, is the next thing. What I would recommend is using the endoscope for every single operation that you have the chance to and get more comfortable with it, get more comfortable with it, and even more comfortable week after week, day after day. And then you may not be using it for any sort of productive way in the first operation, the first week, or even the first month. Then you will find that the second month you're using it to do to look around the corners and look around blind spots and you say, aha, there's something left. And in the third month, you'd be saying, oh, I need an assistant to hold the endoscope because I want to do part of this operation with this. And by, you know, whatever, six months a year, you'd be like, okay, back and forth, back and forth, boom, 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 this is better with this, this is better with that. And you're using it finally interchangeably. If you don't, if you're not patient with it the first month, 
you say, well, this will take too long. I'm not, I, I, I can't see, I can't see, I can't see, throw it out. Then you'll never be an endoscopic surgeon. It, it, you, should, you should be patient and you should use it for every operation you have the chance uh, if you have the equipment. The other thing, uh, just a personal uh, 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 experience sort of thing, uh, when, when I was starting to use the endoscope, I got frustrated with it because I couldn't see. And I thought it was just the equipment and the, you know, I was cursing the hospital administrator of getting me bad equipment. It turns out that it was that every time I, I was so rushed with it that I would put it in there without uh, acclimating the temperature. If you don't acclimate the temperature of, of the endoscope, of course it fogs up. I mean, that is just basic chemistry and physics. So you put the endoscope from a cold environment on the back table into the patient's head and it fogs up and they go, ah, it's terrible, throw it out. Well, you know what? I learned after a couple of times, say, wait a minute, I'm the idiot. If I just put it in some warm water and put it in there, then it's the temperature change, there's no change. And actually the endoscope doesn't fog up. That's, an, that's, an, that's just an anecdote for how you need to be a little bit patient and, and not to throw out the piece of equipment too early. Uh, but to your point, endoscope endoscopy is here to stay. You should use it for every operation because in every single operation, I bet you there's utility for it. Okay, very good. Um, there is a question from Saad Javed from Rahul Pindi. He said he cannot connect. There's a problem with his mic. Uh, so he's asking, he wants to be a skull base uh, surgeon and he's now uh, in early period of his residency. What skills should he focus on at this time if he's thinking of skull base during his residency? Well, I think that it goes back to what Azam and I were talking about the cadaveric lab. There are obviously several things that have to happen in parallel. One is the manual skills. You have to know how to delicate, you know, what kind of force, what kind of delicacy, what kind of pressure you put on the drill to drill out the clinoid. Uh, those who develop with time. You need your basic knowledge uh, of what uh, an anterior clinoidectomy is and what the anatomy is and how to protect the carotid artery when you're drilling. Those, that's a basic knowledge sort of thing. So that is easy because that you just have to read and read and read uh, as opposed to you know, experience with a drill that comes with a lot more time. But Finally, you have to have a philosophical basis, which is, the, which is again the basis of this lecture. You have to start developing ways of thinking about things. Most important, which is how to set goals of individual operations. And again, that is a little bit of mixture between experience and reading. So um, it, it's gonna sound like I'm being commercial here, but the, the, my textbook, my book, The Skull Based Surgery Strategies is written for exactly a person like a, a junior trainee to start developing a thought process and a scheme to uh, set goals and design operations. So I hope I've answered that question, but there has to be several things going in parallel. Uh, Mohammed uh, Rana has a question. Yes. Hello, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, okay. Rana, where, where are you from? Yeah, I'm from Bangladesh, Dhaka. Okay, brilliant. Uh, so I have a question. For basilar top aneurysm surgery, somebody use the subtemporal or pretemporal extradural approach, then go to the base of the skull, then go, go then do durotomy and uh, do the transcavernous approach to, to treat or clip the aneurysm. And somebody do very beginning, a, a do, uh, do durotomy and uh, trans, uh, transylvian dissection and goes to the aneurysm and call, uh, do uh, clip reconstruction. So which one is preferable, whether extradural then uh, intradural or very beginning is uh, intradural then uh, transylvian dissection? Oh, I would say that there's absolutely no answer to that question because you, you need to know the exact anatomy of the, the aneurysm to be able to make that call. Uh, that goes back to, you know, remember when my first slide, you know, you put up a tuberculum cellum and ingioma and say, well, is this a, a uh, uh, mendable to an endoscopic approach? Well, it depends on what the goal is. So here again, it, the, the question is not answerable because we have to know the exact nuance of the aneurysm to be able to answer that question. Is the aneurysm pointing 
to one side, the other side, up, down. Where is the dorsum cellae in, in, in relationship with the aneurysm, dome in, in relation to the aneurysm neck? Uh, those, it goes back to, again, setting the goals of the operation and you need all the information, uh, the patient factor, anatomical factors, uh, and, and your own skill factors to be able to set the goal and to, to design the operation. So unless you can show us a scan and tell us about the patient, it's impossible to answer your question. Yeah, the, the other thing that I learned over my career as well is that um, when you have a microscope and you're recording everything, uh, you need to go back and edit the surgeries that your bosses have done or you have done and see what were the steps that were, should have been taken, what happened eventually, why were they operating in the wrong place or the wrong um, step at that time when something else needed. And you learn from those. And once you do that, especially in skull-based surgery, you get better and better. And anatomy, there's nothing uh, better than knowing the anatomy right for skull-based surgery. I completely agree. Uh, there are, you know, I, I have now uh, gone to recording every single operation and I encourage all my trainees to do that from day one after they start getting the practice. And when you do the editing is when you recognize your, your mistakes. They're not big, big mistakes. They're not, they may be very small little things, but time and again, I would say, wait a minute, I, I saw this thing, it was right in front of me, but I didn't notice it until I'm now editing the video. So, you know, uh, and, and it, I, I, think, I, I think this will probably happen still all the way to the end of my career, you know, but, but then you learn, you, you learn from that, hey, the next time notice that the fourth nerve is sitting right there. Uh, you don't have to be hunting for it. Okay, we have Imad Abud from Syria. He's saying again, there's a problem with his mic. So he's asking, with examples, can you tell us when to stop for a junior consultant? Again, uh, everybody's trying for the golden answer here. And, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid that I, I cannot uh, uh, give one to you. Um, again, it has to set the goal and, and you have to recognize when the goal is achieved. I'll only give you a, a story, perhaps, to answer that question. Uh, it's, again, one of those stories that have a sad ending, but it goes to uh, making the point of how complications teach you everything. So a giant pituitary adenoma, huge, giant, uh, and we did a transcranial approach for it because it was uh, very lateral. And the goal has always been to decompress the brainstem, decompress the cranial nerves. Uh, and uh, we, we did know that it was underneath the carotid. So we were doing, and we're doing hours and hours of meticulous work, taking it off the stem, decompressing both third nerves on both sides in the interpeduncular cistern. And uh, fi you know, we're almost, I mean, decompressing the brainstem was done. Uh, optic uh, apparatus was completely decompressed. And there was one small piece that was left. And it was maybe about 2% of the tumor total volume. It was, it was underneath the ipsilateral carotid. And it was get to the five o'clock in the afternoon and my chief resident said, you know, we are done. We are done, we are done. And I was uh, not heeding my own uh, uh, warnings. And I looked at that, I think, you know what? I bet you I can't get this out. Now, hang on a second. Total resection was never the goal. Total resection was never the goal. And for somehow I got duped by myself to say, you know what, I want a pretty scan here. Um, you, you, you can predict where this ends, right? You, you know how the story ends. Uh, I took that little bite and the carotid busted open and uh, we needed, ended up uh, taking that carotid endovascularly in the neck. Uh, and it happens that she has no ACOM. And so she had a humongous infarct middle cerebral artery. Um, and and, and when, knowing when to stop, um, sometimes it's not even a internal voice. Sometimes it's your trainee's voice that's sitting next to you going, hey, it's time to stop, damn it. Um, and and you, you got to be able to, to, to pull yourself away from your own body almost and ex external uh, look at yourself and say, hey, it's time to stop. Um, and you, it, it's a matter of self-control it's a matter of uh, uh, you know, understanding your own weaknesses uh, and, and your own impatience and personality and your, your drive for success uh, to have that clean scan. Uh, you gotta stop. So uh, you know, 
keep having conversations with yourself is ultimately how you're going to learn. Okay, awesome. Um, there was a question. Uh, do we have still more time? Someone might ask? Yeah, we have five more minutes to go. So we have time. Don't worry. Uh, so there's a question uh, from uh, Iman uh, Yuklith from Morocco. How do you manage a carotid artery injury? Um, okay. So you've laid the clinical history. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, I am the I am the uh, I, you know I am the expert in this. Okay, I, I call myself the, the the master of disaster. So you you come to the right place. Um, uh, there, there is no complication that I have not seen and, and suffered through. Um, uh, not a lot of skull surgeons, by the way, would admit that to you. Um, so carotid injury. Um, well, one thing I would say not to do, and this is a Harry Van Lover saying again, is panic. Uh, I've tried it, it doesn't work. When you're early in practice, when you're injured carotid, what you, what you end up having is a, set, is a tingling sensation up and down your spine going, oh my God, uh, I have fortunately lost that now. And, uh, and I've also learned that panic really doesn't work. Uh, well, first you have to stop it. Are, are we talking endovascular? Endo, I mean, sorry, endonasal or, or, or open? Oh, they left it. Uh, I guess it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll answer both of them. First of all, you have to stop the pleating, right? Uh, and 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 tamponade and, and pressure is 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 one way of doing it. Um, and and then you now hopefully you have you have actually thought about this beforehand. And have an escape plan, an escape route for this. Uh, and, and, and this is something that I should probably add to the lecture: is that you you, all, you should always have an escape uh, route for all the disasters. So you tamper out the bleeding, you stop the bleeding for a moment, and you assess the field. Um, what is going on? Where can I control the bleeding? Is is an aneurysm clip uh, usable, or do I need to call in my endovascular colleagues and try to take the uh, take the vessel some other way? Um, but, uh, or is it, is it, can I repair this? Do I have time to do a bypass? All those come into to play, but hopefully you had an escape route plan. Uh, but stopping the bleeding, tamponading the bleeding, of course, first. Uh, I, I've had several occasions, unfortunately, where the endovascular route was the only route available to, to, to end the, the bleeding, stop the bleeding. Uh, those are never really pretty unless you're a full circle Willis, and sometimes you can get away with it. Um, there is a, there is, there are of course models, simulation models now that teaches you how to deal with this in an endonasal, uh, environment. Uh, people talk about, uh, using a crushed piece of muscle that sometimes helps. Uh, but again, every time it's a little bit different, but you know, you just have to stop the bleeding, take a deep breath, and then try to find a plan. Uh, now. One last thing to talk say about this is that once the bleeding is somewhat near controlled, you got to go back and say, "Hey, hang on a second. Have I finished the goal here? Have I have I done the job?" And if the patient is in fact stable and the and the bleeding is now controlled, you really need to say, "Okay, should I stop here or should I do a little bit more?" And it depends on how stable or unstable the patient is and whether the goal is how near completion the goal is, of course. But uh, every 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 situation is going to be somewhat different. I'd like to just touch on a couple of points that uh, Dr. Jean made is that, uh, you know, first and foremost, the, 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 there's a limited number of complications or types of complications that can occur. Um, it's not as infinite as the, the approaches or their nuances, but, you know, you have, you know, you have vascular injury for most tumor surgery. That's, that's the main mechanism of complication is vascular. You have cranial neuropathies. Uh, and then there's other things like, you know, injury to deep white matter tracts, uh, hematoma, brain swelling, seizure. So there's a limited number of things that, that can occur that you can make your own list and you should have these very well rehearsed in your mind for regardless of at which point in the operation that that, that event occurs, you should have a, a set list of things that you're going to do. You know, when you go into an exam for the trainees going in to take an exam, you know, you, you either go in with confidence or you go in uh, timid and, and with fear. 
And the thing that, that, make, that separates the one that goes with confidence and with fear is the one who's prepared. And preparation really hinges upon your ability to understand the possible outcomes. What will happen if this occurs at this time? What would I do? And if you, if you have some semblance of a structure of what you would do, uh, that's, the, that's key. Uh, the other factor, the other things that Dr. Dean mentioned, which was number one, not to panic, is, is so critical. Not only do, does the surgeon not perform well when they panic, their trainees, you know, it gets transferred to every person in the room. And you know, if you watch the chaos that ensues from that, um, uh, it is something to behold. So really, the key thing is to, to remain calm have a mantra, you know, say your Eiffel Kursi for the Muslims in the room, I don't know, but whatever, whatever you will, whatever have you, whatever your system is, is to follow that, that system of calming yourself down first and foremost, and then execute whatever plan that you have had in place. It, some combination of tamponade, depending on if you're extradural or intradural for carotid injuries. If you're clever, you will prepare the, you know, have the neck prepped ahead of time in every case. I do that for every endonasal case that I do. Why? Because it brings everybody into the possibility that, that a vascular injury can occur. I prep the groins in every single endo, endonasal case. Why? Because that's oftentimes the method of, of how these things are treated um, is and, and endovascularly. And it, and it clues everybody into the fact that even though this is a tumor operation, there's a vascular complication of great significance that could occur. Totally agree there, Hassan. Um, uh, so, uh, sorry, Azam. Hassan, have you got any comment? Um, you know, I think, I think uh, one of the things that I just wanted to mention was that uh, we talk about complications and, um, and maybe this is something for, to ask uh, uh, Walter as well is, you know, a lot of the surgeries that we do have significant complications and, you know, it can take a toll on you personally and emotionally as well. How, how do you deal with that uh, just throughout your career? And, and do you have any tips about that? To yeah, I, I go and beat my trainees. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't you have scars? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, geez. Um, wow. Uh, you know, th this is what we get paid for, right? I mean, you, you know, everybody, everybody can do, everybody can emotionally sustain a uh, petroclavum meningiomas that walk out of the hospital the next day. Everybody says, you know, oh, celebration's easy. I mean, celebration is easy. Uh, handling emotionally wrecking a patient is is what you're getting paid for what i'm getting paid for the, the the what the society allows us to have the salary structure that we do because uh, they recognize that you know uh if everybody is a l5s1 disc and walks out the next day like, no, everybody can be a neurosurgeon it, it's the it's the ability to to emotionally handle wow you just killed someone uh, now, not intentionally, of course, but th that is the emotional toll that you have to be able to sustain to be a neurosurgeon, and that's what uh, uh, that that is the, the most perhaps the most challenging part of our jobs. Um, wow, um, this hasn't hasn't happened to me for a while, but you know, you go back and you uh, you, you 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 go back to your uh, religion whatever religion you belong to and you, you ask for forgiveness um you know you, you've done some major harm here and you look at the family and you say wow uh, this this family is now without someone because of what happened in my operating room and you 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 know maybe not in so many words but you you pray for forgiveness either to your uh, to your god and to the family and um, you know, hope that your emotional fortitude is able to, to sustain you until the next time um, this happens. Um, case in point ha happened about a year ago. I think that was the last one that I had to do this. Uh, but it takes it takes about a week. It takes about a week for you to uh, to do that internal soul cleansing to be able to say, okay, now I can get back up and and do it again. Um, yeah, but that's uh, probably the most challenging part of the job. I think okay. the I think that uh, 
it, it absolutely is. You know, the, the difference in responsibility, the weight of responsibility that you feel ultimately as the attending and, and the, for the trainees, no matter how invested you are in the patient's outcome, the ultimate responsibility is still not yours. And so there's ability to deflect these, uh, the sentiment, the feeling that you get from the bad outcome right now. But soon you'll be dealing with this yourself. Um, how do you handle this? And unfortunately, we'll all have some bad outcomes. There's none of us that have not harmed. The, the first thing I think that's, that's key, and, and, and I can share my sort of method, is number one, honesty with the family. It's, it all starts with honesty. You have to be honest with everybody, the family, your staff, and yourself about what, what happened in that situation. Uh, when there's blame to be had, and there's many studies on this, uh, at least in the United States regarding blame, when you're honest with the family, even if you say it was my fault that this happened, that is much better received than some way of trying to weasel out of it with some half-baked explanation that you know people are not stupid in general. They're able to read your emotion and be able to tell what actually happened. Lies have a way of being found out eventually and so you can either, being honest up front is the best policy, either whether you're forthright and have that within you to be honest or from a self-preservation mode, if you don't, uh, it's still the, the best way of handling the situation. The second thing I would say is that the greatest disservice you can do to that patient beyond having hurt them is to not have learned from it. Uh, so truly, understand what were the sequence of events that led to that. I'll, I'll tell you my own experience. It's some component of preparation or lack thereof, inability to understand the pathology uh, or, or what was the goal of the surgery as Dr. Jean has, has mentioned already. Um, it'll have all these components to it and you'll come up with 50 things that you would do differently from, from one single complication and you'll never forget them. If you, if you have the right sentiment. So that's part of my coping strategy. The last thing I would say is that, you know, we all have families and have other things and our families expect us to be, you know, husband, father, brother, sister, whatever have you uh, to them, despite what happens at quote unquote work. Now you can tell your family that you've had this complication occur, but they doesn't take away from the fact that you still have a job to do at home. And so, I take some time at work <laughs> by myself in my office to think a little bit about it, try to wrap my mind around it, make sure that I'm emotionally okay before, before I go home. And I put that you know, into a little box, you know, the, the, that experience. And I say, okay, I'm gonna come back to it at a set time to think about it again. It's usually the next day. Now it's, it's impossible to compartmentalize it like that, but, but uh, I'd say that it's critically important uh, to be able to do that, to be able to separate it as best you can for some time, uh, and go, but definitely go back to it. Uh, it'll keep creeping its way in. And as the experienced, certain more experienced one, one gets, I think the better they are at handling complications, not because they get used to it, I don't think. I don't think it's that because it, in my experience, it hurts more as you go further along. But they get better at compartmentalizing it and, and, and figuring out the opportunities that they have, scheduling time to, to think about their complications. The last thing I'll add is that, you know, we, you know the, the seven stage of grieving, you know, the surgeons actually have to go through the seven stages as well. I think, I, I believe I, I thought about this uh, once. I think it's really three stages for surgeons. I don't remember what I said with the three stages, but, you know, again, the LaRiche quote about everybody, every surgeon has a tiny cemetery where they go and where he goes and prays uh, to think about his own inadequacies in the past and learn from him. You, the, the most important thing is going through that process. If you don't have that space set up, that little cemetery set up, if you don't go through the reflection, you will become dangerous. And, uh, and emotionally, it will scar you to extents that you don't uh, want it to. Uh, so go through those seven the, the stages, however many stages you have, uh, and learn from them. Okay, brilliant. Uh, uh, we're just going to wrap up this and you're really grateful. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. I really enjoyed it. There were things that, you know, if I was a resident, I would have preferred to hear all this at that time. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, seriously, there's, 
there was so much in it and uh, all that um, structured uh, way of approaching to skull base was brilliant. I really enjoyed that. Um, by the way, I read the, uh, this chapter as well as enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah, so, so I'm grateful. Thank you, Hassan and um, Azam, you both were great. Amjad is here as well. Um, we're starting this um, collaboration with um, Azam and um, Hassan uh, in doing this Residence Corner in which you're gonna go through Rotor Neuroanatomy. So our first module is, is our four talks and it's about ventricles. And that's what we have for uh, uh, tomorrow. And we have, uh, Azam is gonna be taking up the residents with, uh, and taking them through Roton um, Anatomy of Ventricles. And uh, we're gonna follow that up with three other talks in that same module that's gonna happen in next uh, two weeks. Um, and then we have Amjad Shad, who's gonna be talking about how to prepare for a neurosurgery exit exam. Uh, we have a lot of, a lot of trainees who will be taking the exam, so it's gonna be good for them. Um, so that's what we have for tomorrow. Um, on Friday, oh, Imad, have you got something for Friday for us? Um, one second. We have John Lee from Philadelphia. So he's going to be uh, talking about endoscopic approaches um, to the posterior fossa tumors. Um, and with him is Joachim Morotel from Germany, who's going to be moderating that session. And, and we come back on a, a Saturday and we do another anatomy course on Saturday with the residents. So guys, it was really a pleasure seeing you again. And uh, Azam and Hassan, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully same time. And Amjad. And uh, everybody else is most welcome. And, uh, and I'm really grateful. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, any uh, last comments from you, Walter G? No, just uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And I look forward to uh, doing this again with you. Sure, it's, it's re really our pleasure. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>